This is the Texas Instruments 83 plus calculator. Uh, this calculator has been around for a while. It came onto the market in 1999. So as of the making of this video, it's been around for 18 years. Incredibly, they are still making and selling these things. Its ancestor was the TI-81, which came out in 1990. And about every three years or so, they would upgrade it, usually by adding more memory to it, maybe increasing the speed of the microprocessor. In uh, 1993, they had the TI-82. In 1996, they had the TI-83. In 1999, they had the TI-83+. Plus. Uh, this one. Now they all use the same microprocessor, the Zilog Z80, which itself came out way back in 1976. And then after this was the TI-84 Plus and then a color version of the TI-84 Plus. But they all have the keys in the same locations. They all use the same operating system, the same microprocessor. So if you train on any one of them, you can use any of them. So they've become very embedded in our educational system. I acquired four of these. These were salvaged from the local electronic recycling center. They'd all been thrown away together. And they all have problems. And this one here is, is currently doing not. This one here is intermittent. Currently, it's not doing anything. This one's all, virtually all black. This is crazy characters. This one. Sort of, well, there's an incorrect character. Biggest cause of trouble in these calculators is a cable that runs between the main board and there's a separate board which holds the uh, LCD display. And there's, a cable, there's a cable running between those two, and that seems to be the cause of most of the problems with these things. So we're going to see if we can't replace that cable and fix the problems. Here's one of our Texas Instruments TA83 Plus calculators with the screwy screen problem. My goodness, what a mess. Look at that. I mean, just nothing making sense there. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and take this apart and see if we can't do something about it. And what you'll need here is a T6 uh, Torx screwdriver and a small Phillips head screwdriver. Okay, we'll begin by just removing our batteries. Now we have this little screw right here that needs to come out. Small Phillips head screwdriver. It and what it does is it removes this little lid. Underneath the lid is our little coin battery, which uh, keeps the memory alive when the calculator is turned off. And that is a CR1616 battery. Now we've got six torque screws. One, two, three, four, five, six that need to come out. I'll go ahead and get those out now. Now we should be able to open the calculator. Okay, there's one tab right there across the top. Clips here, here, and here kind of hold the thing together. Now we have some small Phillips head screws to remove. One, two, peel back this uh, insulation. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And we shall go ahead and remove those.
After we have removed all the screws, we can now lift the uh, circuit board out and it's in two parts. There's a main board and then there's a separate board for the LCD screen. This is the front cover and of course it contains the buttons. You want to be careful not to flip that over because all the buttons can spill out. You'll have a hard time putting it all back together. Now we just have to sort of peel that shielding back out of the way. Here's our problem. This little cable right here it connects the main board to the LCD screen board. Not quite sure why they built it this way. Uh, but this cable fails over time. This cable is not soldered into place. It's actually glued into place. This is just a, an adhesive holding it in place. And I suspect that that glue goes bad over time. Perhaps it oxidizes or some other chemical reaction where it just dries out. In any event, it it, stop, it, it stops conducting after a while and it fails. The only thing we can really do is remove this cable and patch in some wires in its place. You'll see there are 15 narrow connectors and two wide connectors. Presumably the wide connectors power this thing. You know, there's probably a plus voltage in a ground and the, and the 15 narrow ones are presumably signal lines. This is the conducting cable, but right behind it, there's a big piece of black tape that looks like electrical tape. And the two are glued together. But now these two pieces of tape basically sandwich around the board like this. I guess that helps prevent it from peeling off, I suppose. But anyway, we just have to cut this whole thing off. So that is what we shall do. We'll start on this side. This cable isn't held on by much. It just sort of peels right off. It just, it's just like I say, it's just a weak adhesive. It just peels right off. Not much to it. And then on the other side, I'll just peel off the rest of this black electrical tape. Okay, that's, that's one side. And here's the LCD board side. This side's a little harder because it's got these, these edge pieces here kind of getting in the way of the scissors. Okay. Now we peel off the conducting cable. Now the black part of the cable extends behind the um, LCD board. It's sort of sandwiched in. You really can't get that out. We really don't need to either. Now you have to get the rest of this residual tape off of here. There's just some residual adhesive material here. Kind of a close-up of that. We have to get that, that residual white stuff off of there. It's mostly just a matter of getting your thumbnail under it and just sort of scraping away at it. Okay, I've been scraping away for about five minutes with my thumbnail. You can see I got almost all of it off of there. And maybe a little isopropyl alcohol. Can maybe remove any, any residual from there. Yeah, I think that's got it uh, sufficiently clean to where we can solder to it. And we will just do the very same thing with the other side. Okay, now I've, com I've completed scraping the old uh, tape off of this side and scrubbing it with a little isopropyl alcohol. It looks pretty good, I think. These two surfaces are now ready to 
solder some wires to. Now, the next thing we have to do is decide on what sort of wire we're going to use. Obviously, it has to be a fairly small um, caliber wire. These 15 connectors are only one millimeter and they're separated by half a millimeter space. Here I have a, a bunch of old ethernet line. These wires were cannibalized out of a failed ethernet cable. Now ethernet cables contain eight wires, four twisted pairs. Now the wires inside of here are 24 gauge. That means the conductor is two one hundredths of an inch in diameter. Okay. And I have done that. I have made little jumper wires using salvaged pieces of Ethernet. And I was able to make it work, but these wires are actually kind of difficult to work with. Uh, two one hundredths of an inch doesn't sound like much, but you know, a, a two one hundredths of an inch copper monofilament can actually be kind of stiff, can be sort of hard to bend the way you want it. And I found they were sort of hard to uh, solder. You know, they're not much uh, smaller than the, the, uh, the pad itself. Here's a different kind of wire. Uh, this is called a Kiner wire, K-Y-N-A-R, used for wire wrapping. This is 30 gauge wire. That means it's one one hundredth of an inch thick. For carrying just signals, you know, this wire is plenty thick enough. This is good enough to conduct signal. And I have done that. And I found these actually solder on a, more easily and they bend more easily. The problem is these are really hard to strip. This wire is way too small to be stripped with an ordinary wire stripper. You can purchase a special uh, Kiner wire stripper. Uh, they're fairly expensive, though. By the way, uh, Kynar is, refers to the kind of plastic insulation. Kynar is the plastic surrounding the copper uh, core. It's a special kind of plastic that's resistant to most uh, caustic chemicals and uh, good, good for harsher environments. Here's an example of uh, Kynar wire for sale on Amazon. This is where I got it and I paid under $5. Of course, I, did, I, mean, I bought the smallest amount because I'm not going to be using very much. Here's an example of that uh, wire stripper that will uh, strip 30 gauge wire. It's made by the same company, Jonard. It's uh, like uh, 33 bucks. Now, what if you need to strip some wires and they are smaller than your uh, wire strippers will allow? Well, it just so happens that these uh, nail clippers actually work pretty well as wire strippers. You just have to kind of be careful. I'm going to take some of this Ethernet cable, this 24 gauge, and just kind of demonstrate. You know, it's just a matter of don't, don't squeeze too hard if you just squeeze kind of lightly. Sort of work your way around a little bit. And there we go. Just stripped it. Pretty good. Nail clippers for about a buck can work pretty good as wire strippers in a pinch. Unfortunately, when I tried that same trick with the Kiner wires, uh, I didn't have so much luck. These wires are so very, very thin. You know, when you try to strip these, they are so thin. The first thing, if you squeeze just a little bit, you just go ahead and break, you know, it just cuts right through. So you have to be super, super careful. Ever so gently. Okay, I got it. The problem is that it's very hard to cut through the plastic without cutting into the metal at least a little bit. And when you do that, you weaken it. And what happens is it bends for only at that one spot. And then, of course, the wire goes ahead and breaks. There, it just broke. Now, I repaired one calculator this way 
you know, cutting the wire, with kinder wires, cutting it this way. And it was so frustrating. I ended up having to do it over and over, you know, cutting these wires. You know, I'd, I'd solder them in and then they'd break because I had damaged the wire. And I was about ready to give up on this when I discovered an interesting YouTube video that showed uh, another interesting poor man's uh, way of stripping these wires. What this guy did was he took a length of kiner wire like this and he just simply took a soldering iron and just like so and that's it wow what a great idea we'll do a little more of a close-up this time here's my little length of kiner wire take my soldering iron and just it's just so simple you just wonder why the heck didn't i think of that myself Okay, so this way you can strip these wires and you don't put any damage on the metal. So you don't get that, you know, that flexing at the weak point and then breaking. I have cut 15 pieces of kiner wire, two centimeters in length. Also, I've cut two of the ethernet lines. I'm gonna put those on the power lines, you know, the, the, the broader connectors, since they carry a little bit of current. I'm going to go ahead and strip these, the rest of these 15 uh, kiner wires using the, uh, the soldering iron tip method. As far as these two 24 gauge lines, I'm going to use the, uh, the fingernail clipper method. Okay, I've completed that. I've got all 15 of these lines now, uh, 24 gauge lines stripped as well. I'm going to put down a little bit of uh, flux compound first. Just pre treat all those connectors help that solder stick a little better I'm going to put a little I'm going to put solder on each and every one of these with solder already in place all I have to do is sort of heat up the solder and push the wire on top of it now my my plan is to put the wires on this way actually pointing away in this way it'll create sort of a gentle loop there's a bit of a step off here. If I go if I go directly, it's gonna it's gonna create kind of a zigzag, and that's gonna put a tighter kink. By sending the wire this way first, and then looping it back, back it's more of a gentle curve, and that you're less likely to get something pulling off or breaking, and also gives you a little bit more flexibility. Well, let's start with the first wire. There we go. Got it on there. I'm just going to go ahead and do the rest of them. Okay, now we have all those wires soldered on. Now we're going to go ahead and mount this board back into the front case. This way we can line up the uh, main board and the, uh, the L LCD display board. On the display board, we will put a little bit of flux again to help that solder stick on put solder on each of the pins in other words i will tin each pin okay i've got uh, solder on all of the pins we'll go ahead and place the board back in what i will do here is i'm going to put a screwdriver right through right to about here this way I can bend these wires more gently. That's the idea. I'm trying to avoid any kinks. Let me give you an idea what I have in mind there. Now with all the wires partially bent around towards the other connector, I'll go ahead and push them down one by one and solder them onto the other side. Okay, now I have completed soldering all of these wires to the um, LCD board. Let's see what that looks like up close. We'll now put the screws back in and we will test it. I'm 
Now we put the we put the back cover on. Catch that little latch there. Put our batteries in. We can put the rest of it back together later. This we just want to test it now. Aha. Uh -huh. That's what we want to see. Now this is the first message you get. It says RAM cleared. That's because the uh, coin battery had been separated when we pulled off the back cover. It looks like our screen is working. So we'll just hit any key. Yes, that's what we want to see, folks. Look at that. Perfect. So we've brought her back to life. Okay, excellent. So far, I have repaired three of these Texas Instruments 83 calculators with a bad flat cable between the main board and the, and the LCD board. This first one, I used all 24 gauge Ethernet lines. Now here's a close up of the first one. This is the first one that I did with the uh, 24 gauge Ethernet lines. These are, again, these are all two one hundredths of an inch. And that's getting pretty close to the diameter of the connectors that they're trying to solder to. These were kind of difficult to solder on. And in one case, I actually ended up lifting a pad down here and you see I had to put in a jumper wire to repair it. This is the second calculator that I fixed. I used the 24 gauge Ethernet uh, wires only for power. And then I used these 30 gauge Kiner wires for the uh, logic lines. They soldered on a lot, a lot easier, I thought. Uh, I did this one before I realized the easy way of stripping the wires just using the hot tip of your soldering iron. So this, this took me a really long time to do this because I had to keep redoing these wires because I, uh, I kept breaking them. Now in this case, I, I cut the wires to two and a half centimeters long. And you, you, know, and you can see that's just a little bit too long. It's sort of running into these chips here. Um, two and a half centimeters was just a little on the long side, although it does work, you know, it works okay, but I would advise cutting it just a little bit shorter. And this is the third one that I did, 24 gauge for the power lines and then 30 gauge Kiner wires. Uh, this is after I learned of using the uh, simple soldering iron stripping technique. So this, this job went much faster. Also, I cut these lines to only two centimeters and that worked out better. I think two centimeters, again, if you do it the way I do it, you know, putting, soldering the wires in the down direction and looping them over. But I would cut the wires no more than two centimeters in length. That, that seemed to work out best. Uh, just one interesting thing to note, uh, you can see there was a change in manufacturing here. This is the TI-83A. This is the TI-83F. You notice the chips are arranged in different locations. Just something, just something of interest. I just sort of chose this combination of wires, just sort of experimenting. There's, there's no hard and fast rules about this. But I would, I would say this from my experience. I, I would not use wires any bigger than 24 gauge or any smaller than 30 gauge. 24 gauge is two one hundredths of an inch in diameter. 30 gauge is one one hundredths of an inch in diameter. These connectors are only a millimeter. Okay, so the 24 gauge almost covers them. And the 30s are so delicate, they're so thin and so easily broken. I will uh, go ahead and complete uh, reassembling one of these just to show how it's done. Really, it's just taking it apart in reverse. First, we put on the battery cover. Then we put on the six T6 torque screws. Then we reinsert the 
four AAA batteries and put on the cover. Complete. Okay, well, as you can see, they all really do work. Three good, fixed, perfectly normal calculators. If you have a calculator that has a glitchy screen, the screen isn't acting normally, it is almost certainly that flat cable between the main board and the LCD board. As you can see, it is certainly fixable. Uh, all you really need is a soldering iron and some soldering skills, and you can fix it yourself.